Welcome back to another episode of Storytime with Mimi Michelle, and we are still reading in A Mistress to the Game. We are now on chapter two, and it starts by saying, sometimes you have to be reminded. The name of this chapter is Caught in a Rapture, and it's kind of self-explanatory. Now, if you want to follow along, it's a great Amazon find. You can find it on Amazon. And then we could chat. We could, It's just like having, a, um, what's the word? Our own little book club. So, get your copy, and let's get to read. We're on chapter two, two, page 25. And it reads, I guess you could say my suicide attempt was successful, or I am having an out-of-body experience, because I am now watching my lifeless body lay on a stretcher while the doctors try hard to revive me. Miss Devereaux, this is Dr. Corvell. Can you hear me? Stay with me, ma'am. I watched them pump me full of charcoal to help me regurgitate all the medication that I had taken out of my system. She's beginning to cold, the nurse shouts. It was strange because while they were working on me, I could also hear the twins in the lobby crying and praying for God to spare me and save my life at the same time. I didn't realize the effect this would have on my family and I was deeply saddened about how it made them feel. I'm sorry, I screamed but no one could see or hear me. And I felt worse the moment Taurus walked through the hospital doors. As I stood there out of my body, I watched her as she cried out, where is she? Where is my baby? They're working on her now, mama, the girls replied. Suddenly, before I could head back to where I was in the ICU, I began to see a bright light. I can't explain the feeling, but I couldn't resist it. It was brilliant, illuminating, beautiful, and it felt like perfect peace, and I was drawn to it. In the distance, a voice spoke softly to me. London, baby. It was comforting, yet familiar. At that moment, I had forgotten about everything. This felt better than any drug I had ever taken. Could this be God? Hello? Who's there? I said. It's me, kiddo. The voice lovingly cried out. It sounded like music to my ears. As I walked through the radiant light, I saw angels as tall as giant skyscrapers with wings that spread for miles. I saw friends and relatives who had now passed on. They were smiling and so welcoming. I began to rub my eyes in disbelief, but I, I began rubbing my eyes in disbelief because now I could put a face to the voice that I had been hearing. It was my mother. But how could this be? As I stood there in disbelief, crying tears of joy, she pulled me in close, embraced me, and cradled me in her arms like a newborn baby. She, she looked so beautiful, young and restored. Her skin was flawless like silk, smooth like butter whipped to perfection, and her waist length coal black hair shined like important mink. I really miss you, Mama I said. I know you do, kiddo. And I've been waiting on you, she replied. From this moment, from the moment I got here, I knew that this day would come. And as much as I want you to stay, it's not your time yet. Ladybug, you have work to do. You, my dear, will change lives and the world. But first, you have to start by changing yourself. Come here, kiddo. Let me remind you of your calling and who you are. Mama grabbed me by my hand and we proceeded to walk and we proceeded to take a walk. Before us, I could see two giant gates that appeared to be the entrance to heaven, but we didn't enter in. And behind those gates stood a bright image <coughs> that was without form. It glowed so brightly, and I could not look at it directly. This place was alluring. The colors were radiant, and some of them I had never seen before. The beauty in this place was indescribable, and the praise and worship, it was majestic and melodic. It sounded like nothing I had ever heard before in my life. As we were walking, a voice from behind the gate said to my mother, My daughter, it is time for her to see. She nodded her head, and at that moment we walked through the illuminating doors called Life and Death. As we walked through, suddenly I was looking at my six-year-old self, running up the steps to the front porch to the front porch of our home on Plover. See, before we lived in the Bell Glade Estates, our parents owned a modest home in Walnut Park. It was a middle class neighborhood. 
where everyone, where you knew everyone on the block as well as the surrounding blocks. Torres was sitting at the front porch with Copeland and he was singing to her as usual. Brooklyn and Margaret were playing double dutch in the streets with our cousin Julia, Alicia's daughter, and my mother watched over us through the screen door. And here I am, running full speed, ready to spill the tea, as the kids say today. Back then, I thought of myself was intuit of myself as intuitive or curious. But if you let my family tell it, I was just plain nosy. And I was too grown for my own good. As I finally reached the porch all out of breath, Tora said to me, Girl, slow down before you hurt yourself. What's wrong, little mama? Copeland asked. Ooh, we all. Mrs. Brown just hit Mr. Brown in the head with a hammer. And she she caught him kissing Miss Anderson with no clothes on. And he is bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. He's going to need a hospital. And she's going to need a lawyer because she is going to jail, I said. I stood there looking at my younger self smiling because I had forgotten how funny and cute I was. Then Mama said, girl, I told you about always being in other people's business. But Mama, I replied, I wasn't being nosy, I promise. I was just at the right place at the right time. That's what he gets for cheating on, for cheating with that woman from around the corner anyway. If I was a grown up, I'd be her lawyer and I'd get her out of jail. When I grow up, mama, I'ma help people. I know you are, baby, but until then, stay your ass out of grown folks' business. Yes, ma'am, I replied. With the direction of my life now, I had forgotten about little London's dreams, and at that moment, I began to weep. As I wiped the tears from my eyes. I could hear a child's voice asking me, Why are you crying? Because I let myself down, I said. The child then hugged my leg and said, It's going to be okay. Oh, London, don't you weep. God is going to give you another chance. As I looked down to see who she was, I couldn't believe my eyes and what I was seeing. I was looking at my younger self. I kneeled down to hug her and began sobbing uncontrollably. London, I am so sorry. I'm sorry for everything I put us through and for all the wrong decisions I made. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. She didn't say a word. She just kissed me on the cheek. Then I stood up and looked at my mom's eyes and asked her to forgive me as well. She looked at me and said, baby, your journey is it's what's going to make you. Your journey is what's going to make you great. You must first experience pain to help those who are in it. I looked at her and said, yes, ma'am. Then I, then she said to me, we have one more door to go through, and you're not going to like this one, baby. And if you don't change, you will never see. we will never see each other again. I looked at her nervously, shook my head as to say I understood with Little London on one side and my mother Lola on the other, they grabbed me by the hands and walked me through the doors of eternal damnation. I will continue tomorrow. Don't forget to get your copy on Amazon and we'll continue this thing tomorrow. It's going to be good. All right. Have a blessed one.